Amen. We appreciate that. That's what we call hidden talent in the choir that we didn't know about. We appreciate that song very much. Appreciate the good singing of the choir. Uh, it's good to be saved. Amen. Amen. I'm glad I'm here today. Today uh, might be a little different service than normal. If I can get this coat off. Might be a little different than normal. I have, uh, I'm going to preach for a little bit. I'm going to try to keep my part uh, at a decent length. And then I have someone else I have asked to come up and speak uh, to try to encourage some of you uh, as we go along. And uh, I, I, let me preface this by saying this. I've preached a lot in the last couple months especially uh, on salvation. And that's because it's the most important thing that there is. Uh, and we must get people saved. I'm going to talk about salvation today. You say, well, I've heard it, preacher. I understand that, preacher, and I've already been saved. I need something for me. What you need to do today is pray. Uh, it's been laying heavy upon my heart. We have some within our church right here that come and go and are lost and need to be saved. I do not know God's timetable, nor would I uh, pretend to do so. But I do know when God deals with someone, they need to get saved, when the Holy Ghost of God is pulling upon their heart. And I do know that we can keep pushing God away until we become calloused, until we get hard-hearted, until honestly the Holy Ghost of God just doesn't deal with our hearts anymore. I do believe it is possible to sin away one's day of grace. I do also believe that it's God's will that all should be saved and come to the saving knowledge of His precious Son. And so God wants you to be saved. God wants you to come into the family of God. Uh, but God will not make you. He will not drag you. He will not throw you. You must come and accept His precious Son. I'm going to read some verses to start this morning in Luke chapter number 13. So if you're here, you've been saved, there'll be something in this message for you, I'll promise you. And uh, I was, was going to wait and say, but while you're turning, I, I'm going to try to find out, just so the church knows, uh, I'm going to try to, I guess I'll bring it up at a business meeting, but I'm going to go ahead and move forward towards this. It's not going to be an expensive item, but... I'm going to find out who made our signs that we have around the church and who made the sign out front that says educational bill, whatever it says, and points. And I'm going to get a sign made just like that so it'll look good, so it'll match. And we're going to put it right down at the end of the driveway. And it's going to say, you are now entering your mission field. And I'm going to do that as a reminder to me and to you, when we leave these church grounds, we are entering a mission field. We are all called to be missionaries, some foreign, some here at home. You say, where'd you come up with that idea? Well, I saw it at another church, amen. It's not an original idea, and I'm sure it's at many churches. But when I saw it, I picked the granddaughters up, me and Karen did Friday from their school uh, in Simpsonville, South Carolina. It's the First Baptist Church of Simpsonville. Humongous campus, big buildings, that's where they go to school, to the Christian school. And that was the sign when we left. And I told Karen, we need that sign. I need to read that every time I drive out of this parking lot. And you need to read that when we drive out. So I'm going to push towards getting that sign. And, and I would like to get it made to match the others and get it put up there because it's very, very true. I want you to understand that inside our church is a mission field. There are lost people everywhere, including inside our church. Uh, we tend to think we're going to live forever. We're not. We're absolutely not. Our scriptures today will, will show us that. In Luke chapter number 13, I'm going to read the first five verses. I'm going to go back. I'm going to expound upon them just a little bit. I've got a couple other verses I want to read you. And then I have uh, someone else that's going to speak for uh, a period of time. And then I will get back up and close out the service. So it'll be a little different service today. But I believe if you're looking for something, you'll find it. Amen. 
If you're looking for God to give you what you need, you'll find it. He'll give it to you. So let's look here. The Bible says in Luke 13, uh, chapter 13, verse number 1 through verse number 5, the Bible says this, There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans, because they suffered such things? Verse 3, I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Verse 4, Or those eighteen upon whom the tower of Siloam fell and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? Verse 5, I tell you, nay, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Let's pray. Father, I pray, Lord God, today as we look at these scriptures and we bring the message that you've laid upon our heart. Father, I pray all of that our hearts and our minds would be cleared, Lord. I pray the children of God would be praying. I pray those that may be lost would, uh, would be attentive and receptive to the Word of God and the wooing of the Holy Ghost of God. Father, I just pray, I know it's your will that none should perish, but all should come to repentance. And today, Lord, as we cry aloud and proclaim the gospel and the salvation message from the gospel, I just pray that it would do its work that you've sent it out to do. So, Father, just be in our midst today. Move and convict. Father, I thank you and love you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Now, I'm going to say something, and I don't want to offend anyone. I understand things happen. I understand nature's call. But if you do not have to get up and move, please do not move. Amen? I don't want any distractions for myself or anyone else. I want us to think about what's said, what God has told us in the Word of God. I want us to be in prayer, not distracted. Amen? Now, I understand, if, so that, if you have to get up, then I'll know you have to. I'm just asking you if you don't, please don't. To our young people, to our older people, if at all possible. Here in these words, we find the Lord Jesus Christ. His message here is, do not judge, repent. You say, well, is it just Christians that judge? No, we judge in many different ways. Lost people judge. Well, how do they judge if they're lost? You know how they judge? They look at the ones that proclaim to be Christians and say, I'm as good as they are. Why do I need to change? I live as good as they do. Why do I need to change? I go to the same restaurants. I go to the same grocery stores. I do the same things. My language is the same. I dress the same way. I act the same way outside of church. Why do I need to change? They are judging you, and they are, are, they are reflecting their choice of salvation upon you. Right or wrong? I'm just, you are their Bible. You are their Bible. They're watching you. That's not the premise of my message. I'm just saying, the, the Lord Jesus Christ is telling these that I believe were Jews, He is telling them not to judge, but repent. What the Lord Jesus Christ is saying is we need to spend more time looking at the man in the mirror than we do down the pew. We need to make sure we got the man in the mirror, the woman in the mirror. We need to make sure that they're where they should be. I've made this statement and I'll make it again. The man in this world that gives me more trouble than anyone else is my wife's husband and the man I shave in the mirror every day. He's the one that gives me trouble. It's not you. I could direct my troubles on you and say, well, it's the church, it's this, it's that. No, it's me. And if you would be honest, you would say the same thing. So we need to spend our time not judging others, but getting ourselves ready and repenting and make sure that we're ready to meet a holy God. We have had so many funerals in our churches of late. Uh, I hope I'm not doing a funeral for any time soon. We have lost many. We've lost two complete families in the last 10 months, husband and wives. Had the service for the last one yesterday. We have had many 
We have, okay, listen to me, and this is what's scary. We have had more funerals than we have had conversions. That's not good, church. That's not good. We need to stop judging others, judge ourselves, and repent. The bulk of the message is to the lost, but there's a message for the saved. Let's go back to the Word of God here. I want you to see four things, and I'm going to do it rather quickly, out of these, uh, out of these scriptures that we read here this morning. And I guess if I was going to entitle this message, it would simply be verse 3 or verse 5, take your pick, except you repent, you shall all. Three-letter word, all, encompassing everyone. Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Likewise means just as the ones that he's spoken of. Here is the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse chapter 13 is a continuance of the last uh, five or six verses in chapter number 12, talking about discerning the times, talking about uh, seeing the signs, talking about being prepared. I wrote my newsletter this morning. I can't believe another month went by that quick. And what got me was I actually looked on my computer and I've been writing those newsletters next month for six years. I couldn't believe that when I looked at that. I thought, that's got to be wrong. And I looked, and sure enough, all the dates, September is when we started six years ago. But I wrote the newsletter this morning. Of course, this was on my heart. Uh, this has been on my heart all week, and for weeks it's been troubling me. And, I, and I'm, I'm going to give you a glimpse into my newsletter. I don't give it all to you. But we see the changing of the seasons right now. We talk about the days cooler. The, the, when I get up in the mornings, I get up early. When I get up in the mornings, it's still dark outside. It wasn't many weeks ago that it was either light or get light right after I got up. Now it's dark and remains dark. Now, just a few weeks ago at 9.15, 9.20, I could walk outside and read the newspaper if we read a newspaper. But now... At 8 30, it's, it's dark. It's getting shorter. The days are getting shorter. That tells us there's a change of the seasons. Winter time is coming. And you know what we do? We prepare for winter. Uh, me and Karen have uh, canned and frozen beans and other vegetables preparing for the winter when they don't grow. You've done much of the same. You go to your closets, you begin to look for what do I need to prepare for the, for the winter. If you go to the stores, it's the winter clothes that are out now. It might be 90 outside some days, uh, but, but they've taken all that stuff down, and it's the winter clothes. Now you pick out, do I have a coat? Do I have warm clothes? Do I have uh, warm shoes? Do I have, if I've got to work outside, do I have the thermal underwear? Do I have whatever I need to stay warm for the change? We prepare, don't we? Christ is telling us here that you better be preparing for eternity. We prepare for everything but eternity. The Bible said, what profited a man to gain the whole world and to lose his own soul? You have nothing in this world that is more valuable than your soul. Your home will rot away one day. Your car will break down and, and be destroyed and rust away one day. Everything you count so precious to you in this world, your monies will go away someday. But I'm telling you, your soul will either live or die for eternity. And the choice is up to you. Well, preacher, I'm not going to make that choice today. Yes, you will. Because I'm telling you what it takes to be saved. Well, I'm not going to do that today. You just made your choice. Or I'm going to accept the Lord Jesus Christ. You made your choice. You will make a decision today. You may not inform me of that decision, but you will make one. Can I tell you this, that what I'm doing today, preaching to you the unalter, unalter, adulterated rather, word of truth, the Bible, I'm going to tell you how to be saved. I'm going to tell you the importance of salvation. I'm going to tell you what Christ said to these men. And when I get done, this word of God, this message that I preach today, will either be used as your Savior or as your judge. Christ will be your Savior or He will be your judge. You do not want Christ as your judge. You do not want to stand before God the Father to great white throne judgment of God and be cast into a devil's hell for all of eternity. 
No one does. I wouldn't wish that upon my worst enemy. So let's go back to the Word of God. There were present. These were men. They came to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's been teaching here. And they came to Him. And it says though, uh, there were present at the season at that time that told Him of the Galileans. Now we don't know what uh, provoked them to tell Him this, this story. Many believe it's because He is a Galilean and was referred to as Jesus Christ of Galilee. Uh, Peter was referred to as a Galilean. Others don't know if it was trying to pull on his uh, sympathy or his ties that would make him want to uh, lash out at Pilate to look for revenge. We truthfully don't know. But it says there were present at the season some that told him of the Galileans, listen, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. You understand what that means? That means they were, these were Galileans that went to the temple in Jerusalem, which was the only place uh, that it was lawful to give a sacrifice unto God uh, uh, under the law. These Galileans took their sacrifices. They went to the temple of God in Jerusalem. And while they're making their sacrifices, Pilate had them killed and that their blood shed mingled with the blood of the sacrifices that they were sacrificing to God. They were in the middle of a holy act. They were in the middle of fulfilling God's law as written in the Old Testament. These were not, uh, they were not out robbing, stealing, murdering. These men were in the temple of God giving sacrifice. And this is the only record we have of this. We don't even have a historical record of this or the next account. But they were making sacrifice, and Pilate, maybe because of Herod, there was a, a dispute between Pilate and Herod. And the Galileans were under the rule of Herod. But you could read, and I forget which chapter it is in the book of Acts, that after these things, many, many believe that it's referring to this, I don't know that. Uh, after these things, they became friends again. Friends again. So, but anyway, the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Now I want you to look. Verse 2 says, and Jesus answering. Now they just told him of the account of these men being slaughtered in the temple of God, making their sacrifices, and, and they were slaughtered by Pilate's men. They just come and told him the account. They didn't ask him nothing else. I don't read a question, anything. But Jesus knew the intent of their heart. Jesus knew what they were thinking. And look what they were thinking. And Jesus answering said unto them, suppose ye. This means this is what they're thinking. Suppose you that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things. You see, these men that come with this great report to the Lord Jesus Christ of what had happened, it wasn't uh, saying that it's a tragedy that your people uh, this. No, what they were saying is these men apparently uh, were terrible, terrible sinners, so much so that God judged them and had them killed while they were making sacrifices. Is it not easy for you and I to just assume the very worst right off the bat? These men were making sacrifices. You would think you would assume that they were right with God, that they were doing what they were supposed to. They had come to the house of God. They were making sacrifices according to the law. Uh, these were religious men keeping the rights of those, of the rights, R-I-T-E-S, of those days. But yet, no, these men just assumed the worst. Church, we're guilty of the same thing. Amen? We know lost people. We see lost people come to our church. We run into lost people. Or save people. And why is it we assume the worst? I had this in-depth conversation this week with someone about assuming the worst. And I know I've told most of you this story. Some probably haven't heard it. But a good friend of mine in the mountains pastored a very small church. He was the custodian at the high school. I've known him, I've known him for as long as I can remember. Probably 40 plus years now. He was a, a custodian at the high school. He was the basketball coach at the high school for the girls' basketball team. One of the girls made an accusation against him that he approached her and touched her wrongly. He said, I didn't do anything. You know what everybody else did? 
They convicted him in the court of public opinion. They marred his name. Fortunately, his church stood behind him. They wouldn't let him resign. He was going to resign. They wouldn't let him resign until everything washed out. So as this progressed, the girl finally comes home to mom and daddy and says, I lied. He didn't do any of that. I got mad because he didn't let me start at a blatant lie and told it on him. But I'll promise you this, to today, there are still people that would see him and say he's the one that got accused. He did nothing wrong. We judge when we should look at ourselves and repent. Saved people judge, lost people judge. Christ says here that we need to repent, not judge. These men were judging those that came to the altar of God, that were sacrificing, that Pilate had killed. Their blood mingled with the blood of their sacrifices on the altar of God. They were judging them. Jesus said, so you think they're, they're uh, sinners, that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things. Christ goes on to tell us one more story, and then I'm going to give you my four points real quick. He said, I tell you, nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Verse 4, we have no other account of this either. We have no history, but we have it from the Lord Jesus Christ. Or those 18, gives us an exact number, of those 18 upon whom the tower of Siloam fell and slew them, think you that they were sinners, listen, above all that dwelt in Jerusalem. That's why I believe he was talking to, the, talking to Jews here. Now he brings it back around to them. All right, yeah, you brought up the Galileans. But what about what happened to these Jews when 18 of them were killed? Now many believe that the Tower of Siloam was, the, uh, was connected to the porches at the Pool of Bethesda or the Pool of Siloam. You know, where they would come and, and the angel would come and trouble the waters. And there was the man of 38 years that laid there. And he said, every time the angel comes, trouble the waters. I try my best to get into the waters, but someone always beats me there. And Christ looked at him and asked one of the most perplexing questions in all the Word of God. He looked at this man that had this disease for 38 years, trying to get into the water, couldn't get in the water, nobody to help him. He said, no man will help me into the water. And Christ looks at him and says, do you want to be healed? What kind of question is that? I've been sick 38 years. I'm just trying to get in the water. I'm begging anybody to take me, but somebody always beats me. That Christ says, do you want to be healed? You can read that in John chapter number 5. But Jesus says again in verse 5, I tell you nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. He's talking about physically. He's talking about spiritually. I'm going to give you four quick things, and they are going to be quick. Four quick things that we should learn from this text. I have a couple more verses I'm going to give you after that. Number one, we should not interpret someone else's trouble to mean they are a great sinner. Can, I want you to understand something. God is not like us. We do many things out of spite. We're all guilty, are we not? We do many things to get even. Why? Because they deserve it. How many of us have said that in our lives? They're just getting what they deserve. I am so thankful I didn't get what I deserve. <laughs> I am so thankful I'm not going where I deserve to go. I'm thankful I'm saved. But we've all said it, hadn't we? Well, they're getting what, you know what? You lay down with dogs, you get fleas. They're getting what they deserve. You don't know what they did to me. They deserve to be punished. They deserve this. They deserve that. We do the same thing. We cannot assume when someone else goes through troubles and trials that they are great sinners. Who's willing to stand here today and pick up the phone and call Brother Bill Moore, uh, call Brother Earl, and tell them you're sick because you're a great sinner? Would anybody here say that? I wouldn't. Both those men are faithful to our church. Both those men work diligently in our church. Both those men will do anything you ask them to do. Both those men visit people. They may not be perfect. But are you going to call them and tell them that you're a sinner above all else in West Corinth Baptist Church? That's why you're going through what you are. Absolutely not. None of us would do that. Because we know it not to be the case. We cannot just 
assume that when someone is going through a trouble and a trial, that it's because they are being judged for their sins. God is not spiteful. God doesn't work that way, church. We do. We do. But God doesn't. Number two. We need to understand that becoming a Christian does not exempt us from trouble. This new thought process of of get saved that everything's wonderful, that's just not true. The Bible said we're going to have troubles and trials. Amen? Jesus said we can expect to have troubles and trials. We are not exempt. Can I say this though? We will, not, we will not escape all troubles and trials but we, and tribulations, but we will escape the great tribulation. But there will be many, many little tribulations between here and there that we're going to suffer, that we're going to go through for the, uh, for the cause of Christ, for the Word of God, uh, for the name of Christ. If you call yourself a Christian, if you live like a Christian, you're going to suffer persecution from time to time. I could tell you times in my life, but I won't. For the sake of time, I won't. Times that being a Christian, being a pastor, being a preacher has kept me from getting some worldly things. And can I say that I wasn't happy then, but I'm perfectly fine with it, amen? Because I wouldn't trade my salvation or my calling to preach the Word of God for everything this world has. Period. Period. Amen. And I know you wouldn't either. So we're going to experience a lot of tribulation, a lot of troubles, a lot of trials. But we've got Christ with us to get us through. So number one, we should not interpret someone else's troubles as them being a great sinner. Number two, becoming a Christian does not exempt us from troubles and tribulations. Number three, when trouble hits someone else's life, it does not mean you're a better person than they are. Now, many of us do that. Well, you know, I I must be living better than they are because I'm not going through that. I'm not having the financial difficulty they are. I'm not having the health issues they are. Uh, You know, they may not be a terrible sinner, but apparently I'm a little better than they are. No, we are all, if you want to be honest, we're all rotten to the core. And if there is any good in me and any good in you, it's through the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's it. We are all rotten to the core. You may not think you are, but I have news for you. You're rotten to the core outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said, I am what I am by the grace of God. And that's what we are, church. The only reason I stand here today and preach, the only reason that I'm not sitting on a bar stool, the only reason that that I'm not doing the things of the world and pleasing the pleasures of the flesh, the only thing that keeps me from doing that is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. That's absolutely it. But God can use troubles. Troubles in our life, troubles in someone else's life to draw us closer to Him. Just had the funeral, memorial service, funeral service for Brother Bill Bentley yesterday. And it is those times that I choose to try to spend my time speaking about salvation. Because it is those times, for two reasons. Number one is I have a captive audience. They're not going to get up and walk out on me in a funeral. Number two is I may never speak, maybe it's three points. Number two is I I may never speak to some of them again. And number three is their mind is on the fragility of our lifespan. Their mind is on death. They see someone before them or an urn, or a casket, whatever the case may be, that has gone and left this world. And it makes us think about our own mortality. That we're not going to live forever. And that's when you can deal with someone's heart. The fourth thing. Tragedy can occur when you least expect it. And we must be ready. Do you think these that were sacrificing to God on the altar of God expected Pilate's men to come in and slay them? No. They would have been, in fact, history tells us that the Galileans were pretty much armed and ready to fight all the time. 
But Pilate's men chose to come upon them when they were in the temple of God, unprepared to fight the world's battles, sacrificing to God on the altar of God, they come in and ambushed them. Do you think they were expecting to die that day? Do you think the 18 that the Christ speaks of that the tower fell on was expecting to die that day? Do you think the thousands on 9-11 that came down to the Twin Towers, do you think they expected to die that day? Most of the obituaries you read in the paper or online, those people didn't expect to die that day whether it be a car wreck, whatever the case may be. They didn't expect to die that day. Do you expect to die today? I don't. I could. But I've made plans for tomorrow because I fully expect to live to tomorrow. If I don't, somebody come in here and shout, amen, and say he's gone home because that's where I am. But we don't expect, we expect to live forever. These men didn't expect it. Sometimes when we least expect it, that's when trouble comes our way. And that doesn't mean that we're great sinners. It's simply that we live in this world. And there's going to be troubles and trials. In fact, some of the most godly people I know have gone through terrible health problems in their life. I can think, and I, I know I've made mention of this lady, and nobody else here outside of me and Karen would know her, but her name was Martha Lanning. She's dead and gone now, been gone for years. She had cancer. She was eat up because she was one of the most godly women I ever knew. And then she got cancer, eat up cancer. Her, of course, she went through the treatments, her hair, no hair. She'd come in with a little uh, towel or rag wrapped around her head, and she was just skin and bones. And she would make it to church when she could, and she would sit right up front. And she would be the first one to raise that little bony hand up in the air and praise God for what he had done for her. She didn't expect to get that, but she didn't give up on God through it either. And God can take that and use it, not only for her, but you see it affected my life because I'm telling you about it. Her testimony is still working and she's dead and gone. She was saved, truly saved. So Jesus tells this story. We have no other records of these things. I want to read a couple more verses and I'm going to close. In Ecclesiastes, and I didn't mark it. Bear with me one second. I'll find it here. Ecclesiastes, there we go. Chapter number 9, verse number 12. I forgot to mark it, my apologies. 9 and 12 says this. Listen, for man also knoweth not his time. Let me read that again. For man also knoweth not his time. As the fishes that are taken in an evil net. Fishes don't know when that net's going to drop down and scoop them up. They're living their life just like they're going to swim on through the lake. And as the birds that are caught in the snare. Listen. So are the sons of men snared in an evil time when it falleth suddenly upon them. You don't know your time. I don't know your time. You don't need a back row. You don't need to assume because you're 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 18 years old that you've got next week. Young people bury all the, we bury young people all the time. I've presided over many myself. We see it all the time. You are not guaranteed. Others that are sitting, I don't care if you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, you don't know when you're going to take your last breath and you better be ready to go out and meet a holy God. You will meet Him. You will stand before God and He will either look at you through the filter of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and say, well done my good and faithful servant, come in. Or He's going to reject you. And say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I know you not. There's only two places to go. There's heaven. There's hell. It's so easy to accept the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's so easy not to. That's the problem. You can continue on just like you're going. You can leave here today, not make a change. You can go home, eat where you're going to, do what you're going to, do your normal routine tomorrow, go to work, whatever you do. And it's so easy not to accept Christ. But when you accept Him, you've escaped the devil's hell and made heaven 
your eternal home. Back to our verses in chapter 13. I'm going to read the next four verses and then I'm going to close. The next four verses say this in verse number 6. He spake also this parable. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well. And if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. I want to explain that to you. Bring it into context of what we're talking about. This fig tree had received the best treatment from the master, had been favored, had been looked upon favorably by the master for three years and had not given back. The master said, cut it down. Why is it taking up room in the ground? Cut it down. The tender, the one tending the field, he says, just give me one more chance. One more chance. Let me till it real good and let me fertilize it real good and just give me one more chance. And if it doesn't move then and bring forth fruit, then we'll cast it away. The Lord Jesus Christ has looked favorably on everyone here. Some of you have come to this church for a period of time and the Lord Jesus Christ has looked favorably upon you. You still had the health to walk in here this morning. But you could walk in here for the last time. I'm asking God to give you one more chance. Just one more chance. I'm going to explain the plan of salvation. I've told you the importance of eternity. I've told you what it, I'm going to tell you what it takes to be saved. I'm asking God to be merciful and give you one more chance and that you wouldn't walk out of here without being saved by the grace of God. It is so simple. The Bible, we could go right through the Roman road. I won't take time to turn there because for the sake of time and I don't want to lose you. The Bible simply tells us that all sin and come short of the glory of God. The Bible tells us that we need to be saved. The Bible says if we'll confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. The Bible tells us that all we have to do is come before the Lord Jesus Christ and and confess our sins, tell Him we're a sinner, and ask Him to be our Lord and Savior. Accept God's great gift of His Son. And He said He would no wise cast out. Then he says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved not may be not could be thou shalt be saved if you turn to the Lord Jesus Christ confess your sins ask him to be your savior he'll do his part he's never ever failed never ever failed I'm gonna stop there for a moment brother Roger just stay where you're at a moment and I want us I want brother Dane to come and we've got more of the service but I believe I want to stop right now for a moment before I change just a little bit you don't have to stand you can be seated but I want every head bowed and every eye closed there's some that need to be saved you know who you are God knows who you are I know who some of you are I will not come to you I will not embarrass you it would do me no good to drag you to this altar But I'm asking you if God, the Holy Spirit, has dealt with you this day. I have told you the importance of salvation, what I have preached to you today. You can take that and use it and be saved for all of eternity. Or you can reject it. You can ignore it. And it will be the Word of God in this message that would be played throughout all eternity for you to hear in a devil's hell. I'm not going to prolong the service, but I'm going to ask you if you would come. And ask the Lord Jesus Christ to save you while we wait just a moment. While we wait just a moment. Would you come?
Church, you should be praying. If you're saved, you should be praying. Would you come? God may be moving for the last time. I don't know. I wouldn't pretend to say so, to know God's will. But I don't want anybody to leave and fall out, that go out of this church, out from under my ministry, and die and go to hell. It will not be because I haven't told you the truth. Amen. I want you to continue to think. If you're lost, I want you to continue to think. Come find me if you would. But I want to, to end this service with some encouragement for those of our church, and uh, I don't want to embarrass anyone, that's not my...